morning. It's my pleasure to introduce the four speakers for this session. Our first speaker is Amanda Roche. She is FDA's coordinator for the International Council for Harmonization, ICH, and serves in CEDAR's international program where she facilitates scientific and policy exchanges with international organizations and representatives of foreign governments. She's been with the agency since 2012. Today, she will provide an introduction to the ICH and talk about how ICH can be leveraged to advance harmonization of scientific standards for drug development. Our second speaker is Lei Zhang, who serves as Deputy Director of the Office of Research and Standards for the Office of Generic Drugs within CEDAR. Lei has more than 20 years of combined experiences in the areas of drug research, development, and regulatory review. She has worked at the FDA for more than 17 years and also has industry experience at Bristol Myers Squibb as well as academic experience as adjunct professor in the Department of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at UCSF, Schools of Pharmacy and Medicine. Lei is a member of the ICH Generic Drug Discussion Group serving as the US FDA topic leader. Additionally, she's the rapporteur for the new ICH M13 informal working group that will develop a guideline to harmonize bioequivalent study design for immediate release oral dosage form drugs. Today, she will present FDA's role in ICH activities related to generic drug development. Our third speaker is Mark Abdu, the Associate Commissioner for Global Policy and Strategy, providing executive oversight, strategic leadership, and policy direction to FDA's global operations, trade, and diplomacy activities, as well as engagement with international stakeholders. Mark joined FDA in 2013 as the inaugural director of the Office of Public Health and Trade in the Office of International Programs, where he led FDA's efforts related to the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership trade agreements. Prior to joining FDA, Mark served in other senior positions in the federal government, including as a senior advisor in the U.S. Agency for International Development, director for global health and food security at the National Security Council staff at the White House and in various positions in the Office of Secretary of Health and Human Services. And before joining the Federal Service, Mark lived in East Asia for more than nine years where he owned two consulting companies, and he is fluent in Mandarin. And Raphael Brickman will round up the session. Raphael is the Senior Scientific Advisor in the Office of Quality Surveillance under CEDAR's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Raphael has led the creation and publication of OPQ's report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, providing key insights into quality trends of the U.S. pharmaceutical drug supply. Raphael is also closely involved in the management of recent incidents, including the ever-evolving nitrosamine contamination of pharmaceutical products. Before joining FDA, Raphael worked in the biotech and pharmaceutical private sectors for over a decade, beginning with Covance Bio and Pfizer Australia, then as a pharmaceutical consultant for practical consulting and as the Quality Assurance and Regulatory Affairs Manager at Dynex Technologies. And now, without further ado, I turn the session over to Amanda. Hey, thank you, Elian, for that uh, nice introduction. And thank you for having me to provide a presentation on the International Council for Harmonization. I'm just, um, here we go. <clears throat> okay, so the learning objectives for my session today will be um, to provide an understanding for how ICH promotes harmonization of regulatory requirements for the development of pharmaceuticals. Amanda, hi, Amanda. If you could hold on for a second, sorry to interrupt. We've uh, we've lost your audio. Can you check to make sure that your uh, phone is still unmuted? We had you there for a second, but then you kind of dropped off. It may be that uh, the cell phone connection uh, was disconnected. Can you check to see if you can dial back in? Okay, I see you typing in the chat box. And, and excuse us all uh, on the line while we work this out. We're going to, it seems the line has failed. Ah, <laughs> yes. Uh, and if uh, we're going to wait a second while 
Amanda goes ahead and dials back into the... Uh... Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Hey, there she is. We don't even have to wait a second. She is back. How... Okay. <laughs> I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so to start with a little bit of background on ICH, it was originally founded in 1990 with regulators and industry associations from U.S., Europe, and Japan. It has since evolved to include many additional uh, regulatory authorities and industry associations from around the world. And ICH has a mission to achieve greater harmonization and ensure that safe, effective, and high-quality medicines are developed and registered in the most resource-efficient manner. And this is accomplished through the development of internationally harmonized guidelines um, in the areas of efficacy, safety, quality, and multidisciplinary topics. So why, uh, why do this regulatory harmonization work? What are the benefits? Uh, well, first of all, it can allow for more efficient regulatory review. Uh, harmonizing regulatory requirements allows for authorities to specify which studies should be done and what types of data should be submitted to support a regulatory submission, and this can allow the review process to be more efficient. It also allows for regulatory authorities to more efficiently exchange information when needed. And it also allows for um, uh, avoiding duplication of clinical as well as non-clinical studies, which reduces burden to patients and can also um, minimize resources. Um, and this can and promote more efficient uh, drug development. It can also decrease instances of drug lag where a product becomes available in one country many years before it is available on the market of other countries. Um, so in essence, uh, harmonization of regulatory requirements really makes it possible for companies to market their products in many different countries all over the world in relatively the same time frame so that patients can have access. So I mentioned that ICH was originally founded by um, parties from the U.S., Europe, and Japan, and that has since evolved. And this is in large part due to the reforms that were finalized in 2015 to establish ICH as a nonprofit uh, legal entity under SWIFT law. And the goals of the reforms are really to expand the global reach of ICH and focus global harmonization work in one venue so that it would be more effective. As a result of these reforms, we have already seen a number of new regions join the association, and we hope to see the association continue to um, expand over the coming years. The next slide, I have um, just a schematic of the governance structure of the association. We have an overarching assembly, which is responsible for key decisions of ICH, such as the selection of new topics for harmonization, as well as the endorsement of draft and final guidelines. We also have a management committee, which is um, responsible for the administrative oversight and day-to-day -day operations of the association. We have a number of working groups in the areas of quality, safety, efficacy, and multidisciplinary topic areas. We have around 33 working groups right now, um, which I think we're almost at capacity. It's getting very difficult to accommodate all these groups at our face-to-face -face meetings, but you can see that uh, there's a tremendous amount of work ongoing. Uh, we have the Secretariat based in Geneva, Switzerland, and we have the coordinators such as myself, and we also have the MEDRA Management Committee, which oversees the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. Here I have listed um, the the eligibility criteria for regulatory and industry members. So I'll sort of transition to talk about the types of stakeholders who participate in ICH. In order to qualify as a regulatory member, an entity would have to be a legal personality that is responsible for the regulation of pharmaceutical products for human use. There's also a requirement for past participation having 
um, participated in at least three out of the past four assembly meetings during the past two years and having appointed experts in at least two of the ICH working groups. And they would be able to do this as an observer, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Now, most importantly, in order to become a regulatory member, <clears throat> A, an authority would have to implement what we call the Tier 1 ICH guidelines. And this includes Q1 on stability testing, Q7 on good manufacturing practices, and E6 on good clinical practices. And the ICH articles of association and um, pr procedures articulate that all ICH members are, regulatory members, are expected to eventually implement all ICH guidelines. However, as sort of a, um, you know, the first rung of becoming a member is to implement these, uh, these first tier of guidelines. In order to qualify as an industry member, an entity would have to have a legal personality, and it would also have to be an international entity, which ICH defines as uh, having several members from at least three continents. It would also have to be regulated by the majority of ICH guidelines, and the same requirements for previous participation apply. Here I have listed the current ICH members as of this month. On the top, we have the original founding parties, which includes the regulatory uh, authorities and industry associations from the US, Europe, and Japan. We also have the regulatory authorities from uh, Switzerland and Canada. And on the second half of the slide, I have listed the new authorities that have joined since the reforms are finalized in 2015. And this includes regulators from Brazil, Singapore, the Republic of Korea, China, and Chinese Taipei. We also have some new industry members, including the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, the International Generic and Biosimilars Association, as well as the Global Self Care Federation. Now we'll talk about the criteria to become an observer. In order to become an observer, you would have to be a, a legislative or administrative authority with the responsibility for the regulation of pharmaceuticals for human use. Um, similarly, international pharmaceutical industry organizations would have to be regulated by the majority of ICH guidelines. And there's also um, a few other international organizations who would qualify, um, such as the WHO, who participates as a standing observer in the ICH association. On the next slide, I have listed all of the current ICH observers. Um, there's a large number. I won't go through all of them, but you can see that it includes a number of regulatory authorities from all over the world, um, from regions throughout South America, Africa, and Europe. Uh, many of these regulatory authorities are in the process of implementing the Tier 1 guidelines and will ultimately be, may likely ultimately become members. We also have a number of regional harmonization initiatives, which include a, a collection of regional regulatory authorities from a particular region and a few other international organizations as well. Here I have just a, a little schematic showing the global footprint of the association. You can see how it's evolved um, over the years since it was founded and, and new parties have joined. With that, this brings me to my first challenge question. Uh, which of the following was not one of the goals of the organizational changes of the association in 2015? A, allow for wider inclusion of global industry sectors affected by ICH harmonization. B, better equip ICH to face the increasing challenges of global pharmaceutical development and manufacture. C, expand ICH's membership and promote implementation of ICH guidelines more globally. Or D, find new locations to host ICH meetings. Uh, as you can see, D is the correct choice. While we do like to rotate the location of the ICH meetings, the goals of reforms were really to allow for broader global participation and to um, make ICH more effective in its uh, regulatory harmonization efforts. Mm-hmm.
Okay, I apologize. It looks like there's um, perhaps a delay with the slides. Okay, here we go. So this is the process that we used for the development of these internationally harmonized guidelines. Like it's a five-step process. And after the ICH assembly has selected a new topic for harmonization, ICH will convene a working group representative of uh, the members and observers. And that group will work together to draft a guideline. They will share uh, their experiences, uh, regional regulatory requirements that are in place, and uh, come to a common scientific understanding of the given topic. Once they have reached agreement on a draft guideline, they will submit it for endorsement by the assembly at step two. And there's two parts here. At step two A, the all parties, including regulators and industry, are invited to endorse the draft guideline, whereas at step two B, only the regulatory authorities are invited to endorse. So the idea here is that all parties get a say, they have a voice, but ultimately, these are regulatory uh, documents, and so the regulators have the final say. At step three, the regulators will take whatever steps necessary to issue the draft guideline for a regional public consultation. So, for example, in the United States, we will issue a notice in the Fragile Register and invite comments. We have a, typically have a you know, 60 to 90 day comment period. When all of the com uh, consultation periods have closed in all of the regions, the working group will reconvene and collectively review all of the comments received together and make revisions to the guideline. When the group has reached consensus on the revised guideline, they will submit it to the assembly for final adoption. This will be for the regulators to adopt at step four. And then at step five, the regulatory authorities are expected to take whatever steps necessary to implement the final guideline. And I'll just note that ICH has a lot of information available on their website. You can go on and see all of the guidelines that have been developed to date. And you can actually follow the progress very closely. ICH posts uh, the draft and final guidelines, as well as the concept paper, business plan, and a work plan, which will closely uh, follow the progress. It'll provide a timeline for when you can expect key milestones to be achieved and also specify the scope of the guideline to be developed. And this brings me to my second challenge question. What is the best way for interested parties to provide input on an ICH guideline if they do not qualify for membership or observership? A, write a letter to ICH at any stage of the harmonization process with your recommendations for an ongoing project. B, submit comments through either the Secretariat or the respective Regional Pharmaceutical Regulatory Authority when the draft guideline reaches step three and is issued for public comment. C, issue a publication after the guideline is finalized outlining recommended improvements for an ICH guideline. Or D, build a website dedicated to content outlining reasons why, I, why an ICH guideline is ineffective. And here the correct answer is B. I apologize, it appears I've lost connection, so I don't have control of the slides again. Um, so I'll just wrap up my presentation. Um, I'll just note that I, uh, 2020 marks ICH's 30th anniversary. And in commemoration of this event, ICH is going to uh, be hosting a session in November uh, to take place in Athens, Greece. And so I encourage you to um, check out the ICH website to get some more information on that. And so in summary, this international harmonization work allows for alignment of technical and scientific requirements. Uh, for the development and manufacture of pharmaceuticals and leads to more efficient drug development. Um, th there are criteria where parties can apply to become a member or observer, and there is a wealth of information available on the ICH website, so I encourage you to take a look at that and follow the progress of the development of the guidelines. And on my last slide, I have some um, websites that you can go to for more information. Um, so thank you very much. I think we're 
Um, I don't know if we're pausing now for questions or taking them at the end, but I'm happy to take questions at any time. Thank you. And thank you, Amanda. Um, I apologize for the disconnect on the, the Internet there. Um, I was able to keep up with your slides there. Um, the questions will actually come a little bit later. Uh, so if you just want to mute your phone, you can stay on that audio bridge uh, to join us when we go into Q&A in just a little bit. But right now we are actually going to uh, bring up the next uh, presenter. Uh, so we're going to switch to that and uh, get uh, the audio bridges uh, disconnected and get it queued up to go. Thank you, Elon, for the introduction. Good morning. I'm going to present on the scientific harmonization of bioequivalence standards for generic drugs. In this presentation, we have three learning objectives. First, to delineate strategies proposed in ICH refreshing paper on further opportunities for harmonization of standards for generic drugs. Second, to provide an update on new developments in the ICH since the publication of the ICH refraction paper. Third, to describe FDA's role in leading ICH activities for developing and enhancing ICH guidelines to support the harmonization of scientific and technical standards for generic drugs. Global harmonization for generic drugs is important. As we know, generic drugs comprise a significant portion of the pharmaceutical market. Common standards for global development for generics can improve access to generic medicines. As we learned and heard from the previous presentation, ICH is uniquely positioned to develop harmonized recommendations as the global venue for harmonization of standards for pharmaceutical products. Regulatory members under ICH are expected to implement the ICH guidelines once they are developed. We also learned that historically, ICH has focused on standards for new drugs. However, many ICH guidelines are applicable applicable to generic drugs, for example, those ICH quality guidelines. So by learning those background, what are the strategies for developing and enhancing ICH guidelines to support the harmonization of scientific and technical standards for generic drugs? To address this question, the ICH developed a ICH refreshing paper on the generic uh, drug harmonization. This reflection paper was drafted by the FDA and was discussed at the November 2018 ICH assembly meeting and was endorsed by ICH following that meeting. In this paper, it outlines a strategic approach for developing and enhancing ICH guidelines to support the harmonization of scientific and technical standards for generic drugs. It also proposes steps and recommendations for global harmonization of standards for generic drugs. On this slide, I also uh, listed the link to the reflection paper that can be accessed through the ICH website if you want to know more details of this paper. The key proposals in the reflection paper include to develop a series of ICH guidelines on standards for demonstrating equivalence, for example, bioequivalence, starting from non-complex dosage forms and also include more complex dosage forms and products. The second proposal is to establish a generic drug discussion group. This group will assist in assessing the feasibility of harmonization of standards for generic drugs and also help prioritize work areas. 
their regulatory and the scientific frameworks for generic drugs need to be considered. The reflection paper recognized that different regions have different regulatory frameworks. For example, the tablet and capsule dosage forms of the same API are not a generic in the United States. However, it is a possible generic in the Europe Union countries. The reflection paper focuses on harmonizing scientific standards for bioequivalents that can be used within the existing regulatory frameworks by keeping aware of those potential regulatory frameworks differences. There are two major um, outcomes since the publication of the refraction paper. The first one is that an ICH generic drug discussion group, also known as GDG, was formed in April 2019. This group has a one-year remit. And the group is led by the FDA and also European Commission. Dr. Nalufa Tempo from the FDA serves as the rapporteur of this group, and Dr. Yan Welling from European Commission served as the regulatory chair. This group has three main tasks. First is to assist ICH in identifying recommended topic areas for harmonization. Second, to survey existing ICH and World Health Organization guidelines, in addition to the, regular, uh, the regional reg guidelines, to assess the gaps in guidances for generic drugs. And also to prioritize work, work areas, and send proposals and make, make recommendations to ICH following those assessments. This slide summarizes the main tasks and the current status of the GDG. The group has finished information sharing and reached a consensus within the group on the scope of the ICH topic proposal on an initial guideline on bioequivalence for immediate release solid or dosage forms. Based on that uh, work, they finalized and submitted the revised ICH topic proposal to ICH manage, com management committee that led to the uh, next outcome that I will present in the next slide. Currently, the group has finished, conducted um, tasks one and two as shown on this slide according to the GDG work plan. The first task involves uh, to identify additional topics for subsequent harmonization or potential BE guideline series. The second task is involved um, to assess the existing ICH guidelines, for example, multidisciplinary and efficacy guidelines to identify any need for revision. GDG is currently wrapping up their work and uh, finalized the report um, that will be completed in this month and will be submitted to the management committee um, in May. The second major outcomes, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the, the first ICH topic on um, bioequivalence harmonization was endorsed by ICH assembly in their November 2019 meeting. And this topic will be under ICH M13 with the title of harmonization of B standards for immediate release oral dosage forms. Following the endorsement of this topic, the informal working group for M13 was formed in February of this year. And this group um, is led by both FDA and also European Commission. I serve as the rapporteur for this group and Dr. Yang Willink serves as the regulatory chair. The goal of the informal working group is to complete um, the concept paper as well as the business plan in May and June of this year. Following the endorsement of the concept paper and business plan by the ICH Management Committee, this um, informal working group will be converted 
to be the expert working group to work on the actual development of the M13 guidelines. The GDG um, has worked on to propose future potential areas for harmonization that will be related to more complex products. These future topic area can be on the horizon for harmonization, include modified release products, complex injectables, transdermal products, topical dermatological products, and inhalation products. The value of scientific harmonization are being recognized. The bioequivalent studies worldwide can be conducted according to those common expectation if we can reach harmonization. This will help increase efficiency of generic drug development and also increase the quality of generic drug development. This is the essential first step toward uh, global development of generic products. So this also creates opportunities by moving movement towards common standards for global development for generic drugs can improve the access, access to the generic products. The benefit include that products with small markets, they will otherwise may not be economically viable unless the markets can be aggregated across the regions. And also the investment in the development of complex generics can be supported by entries into multiple markets if we can have uh, common standards across the global. There are challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, for example, what are scientific data and analytical tools that can provide evidence to support that reference products sourced in region A and reference product in region B are similar enough that B comparisons will be the same. And this will be the um, topic discussed under ICH expert working group that will have um, representation from both the regulatory as well as the industry. And for regulatory members, a uh, regulatory policy system in each region needs to be established that will allow scientifically sound data to be used. There's also a role for the industry members by, um, for global harmonization for generics by investing in the research and development during the generic drug development and also by participating in ICH expert working groups. They can share relevant data on regulatory and scientific challenges and also provide useful input into the ICH discussions. These can all lead to address um, challenges that can lead towards harmonization in standards. In summary, generic drugs comprise a significant portion of the pharmaceutical market and common standards for global development for generics can improve access to generic medicines. ICH is uniquely positioned to develop harmonized recommendations as the global venue for harmonization of standards for pharmaceutical products. The ICH reflection paper on further opportunities for harmonization of standards for generic drugs lays out the strategy for global harmonization for generic drugs. And the ICH M13 will be developed to harmonize B standards for immediate release oral dosage form drugs. The discussion of harmonization and ICH will lead to global standards for generic drug, uh, generic product equivalents that can help improve the access to generic drugs. Before I conclude my presentation, I have one challenge question for my presentation today in order for you to obtain the CE credit. Please um, address the following statement to see whether it is true or false. The statement is, 
um, a new guideline for harmonizing bioequivalence standards for immediate release solid oral dosage form drugs will be developed under ICH. Is this true or false? The correct answer is that this statement is true. That is, a new guideline for harmonizing bioequivalent standards for immediate release solid oral dosage form drugs will be developed in the ICH, and it will be the ICH M13 guideline. So this will conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer your questions during the Q&A um, portion of this session. And I also uh, would like to thank the Office of Generic Drugs for their support on these global harmonization efforts. And thank you, Lei. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, make a quick jump over to the um, next layout here, so our next speaker can get uh, ready to roll. Um, and Mark, I see that you got yourself off mute. You're all good to go. If you want to go ahead, and there we go. We got the Mark taking over control of the slide. And uh, with that, I think you should be all set. And take it away, Mark. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good morning. I'm Mark Abdu, and I lead the Office of Global Policy and Strategy, known as OGPS, which sits within FDA's Office of the Commissioner. This morning, I will tell you about OGPS, its structure, mission, and strategic priorities. Then I will dive a bit deeper on the work of our foreign offices, particularly our China and India offices, and explain how they help FDA and OGPS achieve their goals. OGPS merges what was formerly known as FDA's Office of International Programs with parts of what used to be the Office of Global Regulatory Operations and Policy. The new office has three sub-offices, Global Diplomacy and Partnerships, Global Operations, which includes our foreign posts, and Trade, Mutual Recognition, and International Arrangements. While all are important, Today, I will be focusing on the work of the Office of Global Operations, particularly in China and India. Before the formation of OGPS, the FDA's international office was often viewed as a foreign outpost of the Office of Regulatory Affairs because of the inspectional work that it conducts. This new structure rebalances the work of the office by elevating diplomacy and the wide scope of policy work we perform while maintaining our overseas footprint in our offices in China, India, Europe, and Latin America, and enhancing the important in inspectional work the office performs. I will shortly cover the work of our China and India offices, but first I want to provide a brief overview of OGPS's mission and its priorities. OGPS effectively advances globally FDA's mission of protecting and promoting the public health of Americans. FDA's foreign office operational activities reflect the environment in which they operate, but at a higher level, all components of OGPS align to our four strategic objectives. Organizational excellence, cultivating and maintaining a high performance office and workforce, policy coherence, promoting mutually reinforcing policy actions to advance FDA's public health and regulatory interests globally, global partnerships, building and leveraging global partnerships to promote public health, and high quality information, advancing FDA's public health mission by collecting, analyzing, and sharing high quality information, including inspection data, to inform decisions.
Specifically, our foreign offices have a distinct role in how they support the agency's mission abroad. It's worth noting the structure of our foreign offices, which feature subject matter experts from our product centers who serve as policy analysts, office management led by our country director and deputy country director, themselves uh, either subject matter experts from our centers or consumer safety officers, our consumer safety officers who perform inspections for food, devices, drugs, and bio-research monitoring, and our locally engaged staff who have a deep understanding of their country's regulatory frameworks and government structure and functions and who assist with language capability and inspection support. Our foreign offices perform the following functions. They conduct inspections. They engage in capacity building and working with regulatory counterparts on a wide range of topics such as international harmonization and the use of international standards and generic drugs. They engage in outreach and education to industry and academia, and they conduct landscaping. That is, providing boots on the ground intelligence as it occurs. This activity is particularly relevant now with the global response to the novel coronavirus, and our offices in China and India are on the front lines of the U.S. government's efforts to address supply chain disruptions. Landscaping also includes, for example, seeking out information on the impact of natural disasters, the impact of government closures, and regulations on industry. And to take another case, the detection and ongoing communication on the nitrosamine impurity issues recently seen with Sartan and Ranitidine products. In addition, our posts often shape any memoranda of understanding or statement of intent the agency has with partner regulators. These arrangements govern our, govern our interaction with partner regulators for activities like regulatory cooperation, joint inspections, inspectional training, and information sharing. Having provided this background, I'll now turn to a brief overview of our India and China offices and their recent strategic engagements. Our colleagues in India, often working with their center counterparts, have a solid record of accomplishment within the past year. This includes by regula by a bilateral regulatory forum and discussion with the Central Drugs Standard Control Organization of India, or CDSCO, in November of last year, inspectorate-level capacity building on the drug inspection life cycle, which was supported by multiple CEDAR and ORA subject matter experts, a senior-level bilateral discussion that urged India to take a more active role in international harmonization fora such as ICH and the Pharmaceutical Inspection Cooperation Scheme, or PICS, as well as discussions of emerging policy issues, including those related to pharmaceutical quality and generic drug development and manufacturing. The Drug Supply Chain Security Act subject matter expert visits in November of 2019 uh, the workshops in collaboration with the European Medicines Agency and the European Directorate for the Quality of Medicines on API quality and supply chain integrity with a focus on nitrosamines, and continued policy engagement with Government of India and industry for policy coherence, particularly around issues of harmonized standards. Turning to China, as you might expect, the COVID-19 outbreak presented our China office personnel with challenges. We have temporarily relocated our staff back to the United States, but they will return to China uh, at some point, hopefully in the near future. And in any case, our work in China has been significant and our focus there has been on the following. For existing agreements and annual work plans, and despite the COVID disruptions, we work with our Chinese regulatory counterparts to promote best practices on inspections, adoption of innovative technologies and therapies, and to support transparent and harmonized regulatory practices. This includes our, high, our annual high-level bilateral meeting between senior leadership, which supports China's National Medical Product Administration's recent implementation of China's revised drug administration law. Over the past five years, we have worked with our Chinese regulatory counterparts, as well as other regulatory agencies, 
to provide outreach via workshops to the pharmaceutical industry on current trends and emerging issues on good manufacturing practices. This has included workshop themes addressing areas such as data integrity, quality culture, investigations, quality risk management, and corrective actions and controls. We cooperate with local industry associations by conducting targeted outreach in various regions throughout China, focusing on identified needs such as quality of submission for generic drugs, consideration for developing biologics, precision medicine, quality agreements, and implementation of a market authorization holder system. We are involved with the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, and other international organizations to promote harmonization and support regional training on pharmacovigilance, clinical trials, good clinical practices, and establishing and maintaining a safe and effective drug supply chain. And finally, our China office supports FDA headquarters interests by providing timely updates and notifications on in-country issues such as government-issued pollution control measures, explosions at drug manufacturing facilities, drug impurity issues, supply chain disruptions, which is where the office is spending most of its time now, and complaints potentially affecting FDA-regulated products and patient safety. I now have uh, a challenge question. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for it. Uh, true or false, the foreign offices of FDA provide, uh, perform the following functions. Conduct inspections, engage in capacity building, engage in outreach and education, and landscaping? The answer is true. They do all of those functions. I should add here, finally, in closing, that, of course, our OGPS offices engage in close collaboration with our colleagues at CEDAR, CBER, ORA, CDRH, and CIFSAN, which provide significant expert support for our activities. I hope my presentation has given you a better understanding of the work of OGPS, and in particular, uh, OGPS work in both China and India. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Raphael Brickman, and I'm the Senior Scientific Advisor in the Office of Quality Surveillance under the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, and it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. I wish it was in person and under better circumstances, but we'll make the most of today's technology. And so thank you all for attending from wherever you are. Today, I'll briefly touch on some of our work in developing methods to assess the state of pharmaceutical quality, specifically as it impacts generics, including some analyses which help inform some of our surveillance decisions and give us insights into drug quality. So some of the learning objectives for this presentation. First, we'll gauge your awareness of OPQ's report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, or RSPQ for short. Our first publication focused on fiscal year 2018, and we'll have the 2019 retrospective coming out soon. We'll also look at general demographics, so that's where sites are located, uh, and epicenters specifically for the generic industry. And last, I'll also quickly mention the nitrosamine incident and the toll it has taken uh, in particular on the generic industry. This is an event I'm sure most of you are all too familiar with and have had to deal with for the last couple of years. And uh, at the agency, we still have a task force in place to continue to coordinate efforts to mitigate supply chain disruptions, prevent shortages, as um, nitrosamines continue to be found in, in various products. So some caveats before we get too far. Uh, when I speak about fiscal years, I want to clarify that much of our reporting is not on a calendar year basis or schedule, but rather we use a fiscal year starting October 1st. So our fiscal year 2019 would start on October 1st, 2018, and go through September of the following year. 
Also, as you can probably imagine, our site and product data are very dynamic. This is something we go over in some detail in the RSPQ, uh, where we see certain regions of the world with large numbers of manufacturing sites added and removed year after year. And this is all just to say that the catalog is constantly changing. And so what we are actually presenting here and in the RSPQ is just a snapshot in time. Also to clarify that uh, sites refer to manufacturers of human medicine, but keep in mind that the term manufacturer does include other functions than just manufacturing the finished liquid or tablet or injectable, etc. Um, it also includes the active ingredient manufacturer, any other release test labs, packagers, labelers, all of these entities in the supply chain. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation and for the RSPQ as well, medical gas and pharmacy compounders are not included in any analyses uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one reason for medical gas in particular uh, is due to the high number of sites within that industry and almost all exclusively located in the U.S. So including medical gas sites would skew most of our analyses and especially demographics. Uh, andesites. When I refer to andesites, that's shorthand for a manufacturing site that is listed in one or more abbreviated new drug applications. Now, even though a site may be listed in an application, uh, the agency is well aware that for business reasons, uh, business decisions, the site may not be currently manufacturing the product in that application and perhaps never will. Uh, however, at any moment, on any day, that site can legally enter the supply chain for a drug product intended for the U.S. market. And so by registering with the agency and being listed in a drug application, that site is now eligible for inspection. And we include that site in the agency's surveillance and monitoring activities. Okay, now that that's out of the way, uh, we just want to quickly gauge your level of familiarity with the RSPQ, the Report on the State of Pharmaceutical Quality. So we've got A, very familiar, B, somewhat familiar, and C, not at all familiar. So we have a, a large and diverse group here, I'm sure, so I won't make any assumptions on what the result turns out to be. Okay. All right, well, for all of you who picked C, this is the cover of the RSPQ for FY 2018. As I mentioned, the FY 2019 retrospective will be coming out shortly. So now's the time to download the 2018 version for free while you eagerly await the next one. Okay, so this is a snapshot of our fiscal year 2019 catalog of drug manufacturers. The three individual countries with the most manufacturing sites are the United States, India, and China. Outside of those three, most other countries only account for anywhere between one and 3% of all sites involved in the manufacture of drugs for the US market. Now, if we look at the regional level, however, and pull all of the European Union countries together, then as a group, they actually account for about 20% of the site catalog. And being able to better understand the supply chain enables us to also look at specific industries like the generic industry, for example. So with that in mind, if we take our top three countries and look only at andesites, so these are again, sites listed in at least one generic application, we find that one third of all US drug sites are listed in generic drug applications. In China, however, that proportion goes up to one half. And for India, it's three out of every four sites in our catalog are listed in at least one generic drug application. So although 42% of all drug manufacturers in the supply chain are located in the US and only 12% are located in India, if we actually take out all other manufacturers dedicated to OTC products or NDA only products or biotech products, and if we just look and focus on the generic drug manufacturers, the US and India are actually a bit closer than they seem just from a, a number of sites. 
So with that, India does become a more substantial focal point when we talk about the generic industry. So looking at that industry overall, one thing we can do is looking at the inspection outcomes and specifically the OAI or non-compliant outcomes. And OAI stands for official action indicated. And this is the status is given to manufacturers when their site is deemed to be not in an acceptable state of compliance with current good manufacturing practices or CGMPs. And these CGMP inspections are also referred to as surveillance inspections. Now keep in mind that a manufacturer's site compliance is not necessarily a reflection on the quality of the product being manufactured. Drug product quality is defined as safe and effective free of contamination and defects. So surveillance inspections are just one of the many ways the agency can monitor quality and assess whether the, there is a quality system in place at the manufacturing site uh, and if the manufacturing processes are in a state of control. So we look at all OAIs from FDA inspections and we look at various trends by country and regions and this helps to inform training needs and maybe even create or clarify guidances for industry. And in the last three years, India tends to underperform the global average in surveillance inspection outcomes, and that coupled with the fact that the proportion of andesites continues to increase within India tells us that we should focus our outreach efforts there. And our FDA India office is strategically placed for this and actively convenes discussions with local regulators and industry to address such issues. The generic industry was also very impacted by the nitrosamine incident. And this started in June 2018, when the agency received notification of the unexpected presence of N-nitrosodimethylamine, or NDMA for short. And these are impurities in some of the approved drugs that used to treat high blood pressure and heart failure. These drugs, which include Valsartan and Losartan, etc., are angiotensin II receptor blockers, or ARBs for short and they're among the top 200 most prescribed drugs in the US. In FY 2019 alone, the agency's task force coordinated about 20 nitrosamine related inspections, all for generic products, many of which were in India. So another nitrosamine and industry related trend that we follow are field alert reports. And these are industry submissions to the agency when there's a quality defect found or suspected in marketed product. Now the exact triggers for submitting a FAR are a bit more involved than just a quality defect. And I've included a link in, to the FAR guidance in the reference section for any additional specifics on FAR requirements. But so looking from mid 2018, when this issue came to light until even present day, we can monitor industry's response. And we can clearly see that nitrosamine related FARs are much more prevalent for the generic industry than for brand manufacturers or NDA manufacturers. And this is probably due to the large proportion of generics on the market for ARBs. But again, this is just to highlight how many different generic drug manufacturers and applications were impacted by this incident and how it took industry and the agency to work together to understand case by case how this impurity was generated, how to test for it, and which process changes were required to address the problem. As I mentioned, we first detected nitrosamines two years ago, above acceptable limits in some drug products. And there have been dozens of recalls associated with this contaminant. Uh, initially, these were in cardiovascular drugs, which eventually led to shortages of Valsartan. But the contamination was then later found in other products, uh, notably ranitidine, uh, which led the agency just recently to issue a request for withdrawal of ranitidine from the US market. We've also seen nitrosamine contamination in recovered solvents and have highlighted this concern to industry and the need for enhanced impurity testing. But so it's not all bad news. Looking forward and given everything we've learned about this issue, we're now better prepared and informed for improving drug quality. And so through industry submitted FARs, which includes root cause analyses, risk assessments, we now have both industry and the agency more educated on this impurity, and we can now proactively look for those con contamination pathways. 
The agencies also published several validated test methods to detect these impurities at very low levels. These apply to the finished dosage form, the active ingredient, or even to solvents, whether new or recovered. And these techniques were devised in partnership with other regulators as well, foreign counterparts. And this is a collaboration that has gone beyond just method development, where we now routinely share information on product sampling and test results. And with that, the agency has drafted a guidance for industry, laying out in some detail recommendations on how to control for nitrosamine impurities in drugs. It's very close to being released and uh, will provide insights gathered by the agency on this issue over the last couple of years. And these insights and recommendations and this additional scrutiny on quality is a benefit not only to industry and regulators, but it's also necessary to ensure we have safe and effective drugs on the market. So with that, um, I wanted to provide some resources. Um, the RSPQ, uh, a draft guidance on the field alert report submission process, MedWatch as well, in case uh, there's any adverse event reporting, and the nitrosamine guidance, which is coming soon. And we can get to the challenge questions now. Starting in June 2018, in which drug class were nitrosamines first detected? So immunological agents, cardiovascular agents, opioids, or medical gas. And the answer is cardiovascular agents, specifically the ARBs. So which of the following countries has the highest percentage of andesites? The United States, India, Europe or China? So it is India and also Europe is not a country. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today and thank you for your time. And thank you, uh, Raphael, and, and actually to all the presenters. Uh, that was the last of the presentations for this discussion. Um, to give as much time as possible uh, for the uh, Q&A, we are going to uh, go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, again, if you have any questions, in the lower right-hand corner, the Q&A pod, Feel free to type them in there. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Lisa so that she can uh, read us our first question. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff, and thank you to our presenters. Our first question is for Amanda. Amanda, are you on the line? Yes, okay, I'm great. On the line. So the question that I want to ask. Now that the United Kingdom is out of the EU, is the UK still a member of ICH? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. They uh, technically are not currently a member. Um, the European Union has withdrawn um, MHRA's participation from the ICH working groups. However, they would certainly have um, the ability to apply for membership um, through the typical process. Th thank you for the question. Okay, great. We have another uh, follow-up question for you. Is there a timeline for when countries adopt the ICH guideline? There is not a specific deadline that they would have to implement the guideline within. However, I do believe um, that the procedures specify that they should be implemented as soon as possible. Um, typically, it, it can take around one to two years, depending on the guideline. Some of them, um, for example, the electronic standards may require the authority to actually get the infrastructure in place, such as for uh, new versions of the electronic common technical documents. Um, but in most cases, they can be uh, implemented within one to two okay, years. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. 
Our next question is for Lay. Are you on the line, Lee? I can hear you yes, great. Lisa, Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. They the questioner wants to know as the ICH or as ICH is publishing guidance like ICHM thirteen, for which FDA has a guidance in place. So upon the publishing of the IC of that guidance, will FDA obsolete the pre existing FDA guidance on the same subject? The short answer is yes. Um, as Amanda showed, at step five, during the implementation, once that guideline has been adopted by ICH, uh, FDA will come up with an implementation plan, which can take one to two years, as Amanda just alluded to. Um, we will um, give a proper training within the agency before we can implement it, because they could be um, through harmonization could be different from the existing FDA guideline or guidance. Once that is um, guideline is implemented, we will withdraw the FDA guidance and just only leave the ICH guideline as our okay, great. guidance. Okay, great. And we have a follow up on that. Is GDG considering harmonizing the definition and the requirements to be a generic? No, the short answer is no, because we have discussed about this, because this is out of the scope of the um, ICH, because it's mainly focused on scientific and technical perspective. But we do um, recognize the regulatory framework can, can need to be aware of. But we are not going to define generic. All right, thank ICH. you. <laughs> All right, our next question is for Mark. So, Mark, you're there, right? We can hear you. Okay. All right, we'll just ask another question to Lay. Okay. Regarding the generic drug harmonization. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Now we hear, hear you. I'll go to Mark, and then I'll take the other question to Lay. All right, now we can hear you. How, for Mark, how many FDA inspectors are located permanently in China, and how many are there in India? So there are uh, approximately uh, 11 inspectors in India and uh, approximately 18 in China. Uh, not all of those vacancies are currently uh, full um, because of the nature of the uh, positions. There are two-year uh, temporary appointments uh, to, to those offices, and so there's a consistent um, turnover in terms of uh, our, our okay, level of Okay, great. Staffing. Thank you. The next question is also for you. They said there used to be an Africa office in Johannesburg, South Africa. Are there plans to reopen that office? There are no plans to uh, open that office uh, again currently. Uh, we are in the process of doing an assessment of our uh, foreign offices to make sure that they're currently uh, still in the correct locations and to ascertain whether we need additional offices in other locations. But uh, the results of that study are not uh, yet concluded, and uh, and there are no plans to reopen the Johannesburg okay, office. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Our next question is for Lay. So the questioner wants to know, regarding the generic drug harmonization, will there be guidance to provide information on performing pharmaceutical equivalent studies in addition to the bioequivalent studies? Um, yes, I think uh, as the reflection paper alluded to, we will consider all the equivalents related to generic drugs. DE is one of them, and pharmaceutical equivalents could be another aspect, but that could be under the realm of future okay, great. areas. Our next question is for Raphael. Raphael, are you on the line? We can hear you. Okay, great. So the I question am. is, yep. does the EU accept FDA inspections and EIRs for contract analytical labs in the support of submissions to EU health authorities? So the mutual recognition agreement uh, does go both ways, meaning that we accept uh, inspections from the EU member states and they accept uh, inspections from FDA. And that goes for any type of 
manufacturer as defined um, by regulation. So I, I think I included a footnote for how we define a manufacturer. Okay. So the, um, the short answer is yes. Our next question is also for you. Can you clarify the percentage of generic drugs that are coming predominantly from India? The, the um, volume of generic yeah, drugs? I feel like out of all of the generic drug market, they want to know what percentage are coming from India. Um, right. So it, there's it really it depends on, on how you define it because some of them are API, some of them are finished products. Um, so it's, it's really just a matter of looking at uh, each individual application. So if we look at individual and does and then say which are coming, what is the volume coming from India, we probably could figure that out. We just haven't. One of the reasons being, and I think this is also in the presentation, is we know that there are generics out there that are approved but not necessarily being actively marketed or even manufactured. So it's sort of a difficult question to answer, and even if we did, I'm not sure that it would provide any insights because we'd also have Thanks to look at shipping records. Thank you. Um, this one is also for Raphael. Other regulatory jurisdictions like EU and Canada have requested pre-market nitrosamine risk assessment, risk assessment, which covers all aspects of the drug product manufacturing. Are you able to say whether the same risk assessment will be included in the upcoming nitrosamine guidance? Yes, the nitrosamine guidance does provide uh, quite a lot of details into the types of uh, uh, things to look for when manufacturing drugs and things to look for when uh, trying to look for uh, nitrosamine. So this could be whether it's a root of synthesis that we already are aware of, so things that are prone to generate the impurities, uh, certain processes, and then also certain um, uh, ingredients or, or even solvents, uh, which we have found already to to uh, contribute to the contamination. So all that will okay, be part of the, uh, the nitrosamine guidance. Our last question is going to be for Amanda. So referring to your slide on the ICH structure, can you describe the function of the auditors? Sure. So um, the ICH Association has a financial audit. This is actually a requirement due to its status as a nonprofit association. Um, and this is really just to make sure that the association is in uh, good financial standing and that resources are being used appropriately. Thank you for the question. And thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, uh, everybody that was uh, part of that panel. Um, as usual, I get to be the time ogre to keep us on schedule, and I'm failing miserably. Uh, because we're actually running about 15 minutes behind. If, for those of you watching very closely to the agenda, we were going to be taking a break uh, from 10.30 to 10.45. We're going to actually be taking that from 10.46 until 11 o'clock. So we uh, will be back at 11 a.m. Eastern uh, to begin with the next session on the ICH Q12 Guidance and Emerging Technologies. See you back in a bit.